To start off, I have no disclosures uh, to make whatsoever. I'm not being financially reimbursed for this, nor have any of the drug companies pro have I profited from them. So today's objectives are the following. We're going to learn a little bit about infant respiratory problem, UTI in children, and acute asthma. And I have to do this all within an hour. Case one is a four-month-old uh, male and female twin who presents to the emergency department. We'll make it University Hospital because that's always our favorite place to see young babies. Uh, with a five-day history of cough, congestion, and decreased feeding. Twin A is a, uh, um, has been ill for five days with uh, nasal congestion, cough, uh, four or seven, now worse, uh, decreased feeding in the last two days. Um, last ate about four hours ago, but only took about three quarters of the usual feed. There's no history of fe fever, and the parents still say the diapers are wet. Twin B, uh, Twin A, sorry, Continue uh, on. Was born at 35 weeks by C-section. Had some respiratory uh, symptoms early at birth and was treated with O2 for 36 hours. Had jaundice, which was not treated with anything, and had a birth weight of 25, 50 grams. And is breastfed and bottled with bottle uh, top-up. Twin B, his sister, uh, has not been interested in feeding in the last six hours. Um, really quite lethargic, listless. Decreased diapers. Uh, and has felt warm, the famous, they have a fever, how do you know I felt them, they felt hot, but not documented. This twin, uh, his past history was a little smaller of the two twins, was intubated at birth for poor respiratory effort, ventilated for three days, and on O2 for three weeks. Had a PDA closed with a couple of doses of indomethacin, and had a small VSD, which has not caused any problems, and is getting smaller, according to the cardiologist. So, their physical examination really shows twin A is uh, uh, a little bit tachycardic, has a respiratory to 62 and a set of 94. Is there anybody thinking anything about this at this time? Anybody got a differential that's brewing in their mind? Is A febrile, has normal fontanelle, and mucous membranes are normal. And the respiratory exam, which was main, showed mild accessory muscle use, prolonged expiratory fees, air entry throat, and some expiratory wheeze. Twin B has those vitals, which are different than twin A's, obviously. I once had a resident working with me who we had brand new twins and he did blood work on only one and I asked him why and he said, because they are twins, they should have the same blood work. <laughs> That's a true story. Anyway, so they don't have the same vitals. They're febrile, this one's febrile, has, uh, looks like they're a little bit uh, drier because their anterior fontanelle is somewhat sunken. And they have more accessory muscle use, a little bit of a tracheal tug, some paradoxical breathing, decreased air entry throat, and some inspiratory crackles and expiratory wheeze. Anybody seen children like this in the past? Right, okay, very common presentation. So, what is our differential? Arbor. Can we go right to the top here? Yeah, I always turn the top. All right. Um, pneumonia, um, RSV, bronchiolitis in general, um, sepsis NYD, uh, UTI. Um, I think it'd be more likely a respiratory due to the fact that they both have it. Um, what else? Um, unlikely to be anything bad like epileptitis. Um, what else? Is there anything else you want from the history? Um, why were they born early? Twins. Twins tend to get born early. Twins no, nothing other than that? Pardon? Nothing other than that? No, nothing other than that. Premature labor. She had twins, so they decided to see section. Okay. Immunizations? <laughs> okay. All right. Um, and anything else from the history that, uh, <coughs> Mom, Mom, Dad, Anyone else sick at baby. home, smokers, history of <coughs> asthma? No, they're all perfect people. <laughs> all right, unlike the rest of us. Uh, uh, I don't think I can think of anything else that I want from history. Okay, I think that's a pretty reasonable differential diagnosis. So what are you going to do next? I don't know all the residents' names. I'm going to pick on those I don't know. Right, Dan? You want me to pick on Dan? What are you going to do next, Dan? I'm going to give you some choices. Are you going to do some diagnostic tests? Are you going to use some bronchodilators? Are you going to use a beta-2 agonist as a bronchodilator or epinephrine as a bronchodilator? Are you going to give steroids? 
Are you going to use hypertonic saline? Or are you going to do a chest x-ray? Or anything else that I haven't listed on this list? Obviously, these are children that we're concerned about. The one on the twin B, I believe, is looking quite ill. I would uh, ask for an IV to be started. That's not on the list there. I would get some, some laboratory uh, tests going, including CBC, um, the electrolytes, uh, the usual stuff, you and creatinine. I would get a lactate. I would get uh, reserve two for metabolic studies. I would um, uh, get a chest x-ray for sure. Um, on each of the, the children. Uh, I would, uh, I, you don't, didn't say anything about wheeze. You said accessory use, so I'm not really sure. Yeah, did you say wheeze? <laughs> okay, I would, I would give, I would try a beta agonist in, in, uh, in, in both children, and um, I would, uh, uh, at least on the uh, twin B, um, I would start antibiotics as well. Okay. Anybody agree, disagree with that? And this is based on your best feeling or how sick they are? Or yeah, I mean, it sounds like you're describing a sick child, febrile, tachycardic, tachypneic, low sats. Um, I think if it is a septic picture, obviously the earlier we get antibiotics on board, the better. Anybody else do anything different than that? What about twin, twin A, less sick of the two? At this point, I would probably treat it largely the same, just given that they probably have a similar process going on. Okay. Could I just ask one question? Danny, if you were working in a small hospital with one nurse and you, what would your very first priority be? Uh, get them out. I would no, no. <laughs> In that list of things that you listed, what would be your first priority? Because the nurses sometimes are going to go in all different directions and focus on perhaps the thing that you want least. Sure. Um, I think, uh, you know, getting the uh, IV and uh, antibiotics going, um, would, I would want to get done sooner than later. Uh, and... Uh, you know, give them a, it'd be pretty easy to give this with some beta agonist as well. Great. I just wanted to hear that part first. Okay. So, I, you know, I, I, uh, I don't necessarily disagree, but let's give you some options. So would anybody do one, treat with neb uh, nebulized sulbutamol? Let's talk about twin A, the less sick of the two for now. And I just presented two ends of the spectrum for you, so that's why I use twins. Uh, send home after some MDI and a spacer, treat with nebulized epinephrine one or two times, give some acetaminophen if they had a fever, give them a excuse me, a bronchiolitis handout, uh, maybe some nasal suctioning, send home, or admit. So I think twin A would, might get one of these treatments, twin B might get what Dan talked about, and possible admission depending on what they look like. People agree, disagree, what do you think? So let's talk about the need for diagnostic testing. So the APP has come up with a clinical guideline statement on the management and diagnosis of bronchiolitis, and it's their humble opinion then by and large, there are no tests that you're going to do that's really going to make a diagnosis of bronchiolitis, right? It's a clinical spectrum. You see it under a year of age. A kid presents with a typical history of URI, wheezing, and subsequent to that, uh, they, you, you know, you can do some virology because most commonly it's RSV, but there are other viruses that can lead to it. And there really are no definitive tests that say you have bronchiolitis. So it really is a clinical spectrum. So from the standpoint of testing, I think the short answer is there really is none. In, this, the, in the twin that uh, Dan was talking about, the sicker twin, he's not really testing for bronchiolitis. He's ensuring that this child is safe and really doesn't have an intercurrent infection that's causing all of this respiratory distress and making sure that they're getting some fluid and resuscitate, resuscitate, resuscitation associated with that. So what about bronchodilators? So in uh, 2003, we did a study across Canada, published in Academic Emergency Medicine, using seven pediatric hospitals, looking at what the practice variation is for bronchodilators. At that time, there had been some papers in the uh, papers published by Terry Kloss and David Johnson showing that, you know, maybe salbutamol does work in these particular kids. And this is what we found. So you can see there's a wide spectrum of utilization of both bronchodilators, a beta-2 agonist, or epinephrine, or both. There's some centers that didn't use any epi. There are some that it's about the same time the first publications came out of using epinephrine and bronchiolytics. It was, it was uh, presented at a big international meeting at the uh, APP, AAP in the U.S., and you can see there was a wide practice variation. Um, and there are later studies done by Amy, not with us included, did demonstrate that there continues to be a wide practice variation if you look at community emergency departments across the country. 
And when you looked at discharges of kids from the emergency department in this particular study, you can see that there was a large variation in what they went home with. A lot, most, almost every institution sent a kid home on bronchodilators, and quite a few institutions actually implemented steroid treatment and sent them home on streamers. Very similar to the point, uh, very similar to an asthmatic. When we kind of look at this, is there any evidence for bronchodilators? Well, over the years, there's been several studies. So this is one suggesting that, in point of fact, nebulized albuterol constitutes a safe and effective treatment for kids with bronchiolitis. Then we have this opinion. We conclude that nebulized epinephrine is more efficacious than salbutamol in infants with acute bronchiolitis seen in the emergency department. Then we have this statement. We have this statement that says, there were no differences in effective therapy for infants hospitalized with bronchiolitis based on these results. We do not recommend the use of either nebulized epinephrine or albuterol, which is a beta-2 agonist in the states, right? Or we have this statement which says, we conclude that nebulized epinephrine is more effective agent than is salbutamol. And then we have this statement here which says, uh, the use of nebulized epinephrine did not significantly reduce the length of stay, hospital stay in the infant and was ready for discharge with bronchiolitis. So I think it's very clear to me that really there is no standardized treatment with regard to this, despite the fact that we as clinicians feel obligated because of the WEAS to use it. So there have been several research studies, and this is a recent meta-analysis published uh, in 2011, done by many of the people who've done most of the research on this. Um, and what they really want to show in this meta-analysis, looking at it, is saying, is there any evidence using all the power of the studies to say that steroids or bronchodilators, in fact, make a difference? And when we look at this particular uh, graph here, we can see that the only thing they could demonstrate based on the meta-analysis that made any type of difference was treatment with adrenaline or epinephrine to reduce the risk of admission on day one, which was kind of one of the earlier papers had suggested the same thing. So there is some good evidence based on that that, in fact, we can do it. All of the other modalities did not, in fact, demonstrate any benefit. There is, if you look for salbutamol here, really no benefit in using that whatsoever, okay? And that's really interesting because all of us clinically will know that there are some kids who respond to a beta-2 agonist, right? But in a large study, using a large population of kids, there does not appear to be any type of evidence. So what they said in their conclusion was epinephrine may reduce admission at day one. For an eMERGE perspective, that's something that's good for us because really when we look at these kids, we want to make a disposition, get them out of the emergency department, and hence send them on the road. If we look at uh, a discharge use of bronchiolitis, there's, there's no really good studies looking at uh, nebulized MDI or MDI by, uh, uh, MDI by a meter dose, of, sorry, salbutamol by a meter dose inhaler. There are some studies of the U.S. using oral salbutamol. All of these studies have really shown no benefit whatsoever to the kids in follow-up telephone conversation or depending on how their follow-up is done. So right now, the conclusion really is, if we're going to use anything, epinephrine may be the only thing that has any benefit. Beta-2 agonists, by and large, probably don't make any difference, and sending them home with it probably isn't a good thing to do. We, uh, Susanna Shu out of Toronto did this study a few years ago looking at the question of steroids, because, you know, it's my philosophy, everybody should have steroids before they die, right? I mean, we should all have a steroid at least once in our life, so this is a good indication. You remember the pathophysiology of bronchiolitis is really necrotizing changes in the small bronchioli of the, of the respiratory tree. And as such, the idea of you use steroids and inflammatory changes associated with that, you may reduce the necrosis and you may in fact change the, uh, the degree of uh, inflammation that associates that necrosis. And when you looked at it, she did a 70 patient study in the ED. This was uh, presented in, at, uh, uh, in 2002 in the Journal of Pediatrics, and what she actually demonstrated that in point of fact that, hey, if you give these kids big doses of steroids, treat them on high-dose steroids for six days, they had a reduction in admissions versus the kids who got placebo. So we all got really excited, you know, because now we had some evidence that maybe in the emergency department we had something to use to prevent them from coming back. Not talking about in the emergency department. Uh, there were multiple problems with that study, uh, including some allocation and randomization issues. So, you know, people took it with a bit of grain of salt. There was a study done in PCARM. There's two big, uh, there's several big emergency network, pediatric emergency networks that do large multi-center trials. PCARM's the U.S. equivalent to PERC in Canada. They had a 600 patient study. They used uh, what's called the respiratory index, which is the RDAI, and they had to have one that was greater than six, two to 12 months, first time wheezers. And they used one milligram of dexamethasone in the ED. That's all they gave them was a single dose, not high dose for repeated days. And they looked at primary outcome was admission. And in their particular study, they could demonstrate 
Again, overall, there was no difference whatsoever. And if you looked at kids who had a history of A to P and everything else, it really didn't make any difference whatsoever. So it appeared in their particular study that, in point of fact, steroids didn't make a difference, at least from stopping or, or preventing admission. And if you think about their four-hour deadline, that may make some sense because it takes between four to six hours for the steroids to sort of kick in in the kid we think that is an asthmatic. We did a big PERC trial uh, that was published in New England Journal um, and involved 800 kids in a, a multi-crossover study, uh, not a crossover study, but a, a multifactorial study. And in this particular study, we looked at a number of therapeutic modalities. We had 800 patients in it, six weeks to 12 months, and their primary outcome was admission to hospital at day seven. When we really looked at it, and we looked at, uh, and this, there were four treatment lines. There was placebo, there was placebo plus uh, adrenaline or epinephrine. There was epinephrine plus dexamethasone and, and uh, dexamethasone plus, uh, uh, plus placebo. And when you really looked at it, the only things that uh, nearly approached significance was at day seven, the combination of epinephrine and dexamethasone given together. So there was a high dose of dexamethasone given at day one in the emergency department, and then five days more of high dose dexamethasone was given at home. That was the only thing that reduced their potential admission. There was sort of a little bit of tendency uh, at, day, at day one to have slight reduction, but you can see it doesn't cross the line totally with the confidence intervals. So the conclusion from this is that probably steroids don't really have a role. I mean, even our study with PERC, if we went back and surveyed everybody at the last PERC meeting, who's actually using I think, information we gained from our study, nobody really feels that it makes a huge difference, and subsequent, we are not doing it. So the question is, going back to Danny, and the less sick twin, do they need a chest x-ray? Well, Susanna Shu did another study looking at that, 265 infants. Only two of those radiographs out of 265 indicated in, were inconsistent with bronchiolitis. So her feeling was, you know, you need about 130 x-rays to find one positive. So when do you want to do an x-ray? Well, um, her conclusion was no x-ray is needed. And it did do exactly as Danny said, it increases the risk or the utilization of antimicrobial therapy. And as such, when do you do an x-ray? Well, I think if you get a poor response to O2 therapy, so you've got somebody on, you've given them O2 and their SAT does not climb. If you've got somebody who uh, has a PO2 of less than 80, uh, 88 or 89, they probably deserve a chest x-ray and infant at risk. And we're going to talk what's the infant at risk. So one of the things that would really be nice for all eMERGE physicians is when we're looking at all these kids and we're treating the emergency department and say, I don't have to worry about this kid. He's going to go home. Yeah, he's going to be crappy for a couple of days. Parents are really going to be unhappy. Well, which kid is at risk of serious illness? Um, sorry. Uh, just one, one thing about hypertonic saline. So there are no outpatient studies that have been done to date, emergency room studies that have been done to date using hypertonic saline. There are inpatient studies that have shown it has decreased the length of stay for patients. We have used this uh, in our emergency department without any good evidence. Um, and the difficulty is, is that it sometimes seems to work miraculously. And they're probably the same kids that would have responded to a beta 2 agonist. And sometimes it does absolutely nothing. So the debate continues until there's a large large, highly powered study to really look at this particular issue. One other thing with regard to febrile infant, one of the things that is, you know, when you see kids who have fevers, the big issue is, you know, do they need a blood culture and workup like Danny was suggesting? By and large, the literature now suggests no, they're immunized. In point of fact, that what you really have to worry about is UTIs. And if you look at people, the kids who come in with fevers, the most common thing is, is associated with, in this particular study, with UTI positive or urinary tract infection leading to the fever. There's been no kids with meningitis, and again, there's no evidence of bacteremia, or very little evidence of bacteremia. So the suggestion is in the febrile infant, if you're gonna do anything, sort of that four, five, six month old, we're not talking about the kids under two months, you really need to get a urine on them if they're febrile as well, to ensure that they don't have a urinary tract infection as a co-intervening uh, co infection with the respiratory illness of bronchiolitis. So, as I was saying, ideally we want to know which kids are at risk, right? And if you look at this, we know that 20% of kids get bronchiolitis, about 2 to 3% of those kids get hospitalized, and a small percentage of those, about 2% of those, will actually go on to an adverse outcome. The worst adverse outcome is obviously death, because nobody likes to have young kids die, but they can be everything from increased requiring oxygen, apnea, and subsequent intubation. So it would really be nice as physicians that we could know what kids actually had an increased risk of an adverse event, right? Because then we'd be able to intervene in those particular kids and make a decision. 
We do know that admission does not equal intervention. Yeah, Brent. Uh, I'm still at University Hospital looking after these kids. How, how sure can you be that they actually have bronchiolitis? I mean, what's kind of the clinical criteria? I mean, I'd be hard pressed not to be doing chest x-rays and kind of the workup that Danny suggested. Uh, I think it's the history of the URI with the classic findings of respiratory wheeze and ex accessory muscle use would be the classic findings. And how do you know you're not dealing with like airspace disease uh, and pneumonia? Well, the second twin, the, the sicker twin could in fact, and would sort of qualify with those low sats or respir respiratory, I would, personally, I would treat that kid with epinephrine. If that kid did not make any progression in epinephrine, I may get a chest x-ray on twin B, but not on twin A. But if I was at University Hospital faced with those two twins, I would probably start epi and then transfer them down and let somebody else worry about the chest x-ray. Yeah, no, no, fair enough. But if, but if you're out in the... Yeah, no, if you're out in, in, in uh, Newberry or something like that, then I would definitely get a, uh, you know, doing a chest x-ray is not going to be potentially harmful to them. The trouble is they all look the same. We try not to do chest x-ray during bronchiolitis season because I can tell you they all have diffuse markings in their lower lobes and peribronchial thickening, and 95% of the people who do a chest x-ray put them on some type of antibiotic. And it's not going to do any good except potentially you know, recolonize them with something else, right? But, but in reality, and, and, that, and it's a hard thing for us to get past because anytime we see anybody with respiratory symptomatology, the first thing we want to do is a chest x-ray, right? And, and I mean, it's, so it is a different mindset. And, you know, I, I had a really sick kid the other day who looked like a bronchiolitis, had a previous history of bronchiolitis. I didn't do a chest x-ray initially, treated with, uh, with Venton, haha, <laughs> then some epi. And the epi did make them look a lot better, but we're still really quite air hungry and, and not responding to oxygenation well. So we got a chest x-ray and they had diffuse interpulmonary disease. Okay? Whether it's viral or bacterial is not the issue, but they did have diffuse interpulmonary disease. So it's a tough call. Nobody's ever going to crap on you for doing it. And I think based on 230 patients, it's probably a little early to say that that's the, the gold standard. But by and large, they probably don't need a chest x-ray, at least in the mild, moderate disease. In the severe disease, I'd argue for it. You're welcome. Yes? Can you just outline for us how you actually use nebulized epi? Because honestly, I can't think of that. So you take five mils of one in a thousand, you put it into a thing, and then you just hold it in front of their face and nebulize it to them. Yeah. Okay. And I'll tell you a story after because i got two topics to go through. So anyways, in the, our big PERC study, we collected information on 1,554 kids of that 800 that were admitted in the study. We collected other information trying to look for could we identify any risk factors associated with significant disease. Out of this, 481 kids were admitted. Of those 481 kids, we had no deaths. So, but we did have five kids with apnea, 10 kids that ended up being intubated as a result of this and 32 of those children, so roughly about 2.1% uh, of the total population that were actually uh, admitted to an ICU. We went back and looked at the data. We tried to see if there were any variables that, in fact, could increase our understanding of which kids were potentially at risk. And these are the variables that came up. So an oxygen saturation in room air of less than 88%, a heart rate greater than 180, less than seven weeks of age, and respiratory rate greater than 80. So if you see any child like that, which is very close to what twin B looked like, those are the kids you get worried about, and those are the kids that if you were in a center that wasn't a tertiary center, you'd refer, or that we think about and may need to have to admit. Does that make sense to people? Okay, so this is what we think is the kids who are at risk. And what's really essential is that vital signs get done on all these kids, right? And that you repeat the vital signs just to ensure they're real. And if those vital signs exist, then you really have to worry about those kids because they're the risk kids at higher risk. So that just summarizes what I've already said. So really, we're looking at a small number. So you're, you, know, you really have to be vigilant, particularly with vital signs in the respiratory effort. So the take-home message is, you know, tests, you really don't need to do them. Bronchodilators, well, beta-2 agonists, by the evidence, really doesn't make a difference, at least from the eMERGE perspective of getting them home and out the door or for their hospital stay. Epinephrine probably has some role, at least in the early treatment, maybe no role in the hospitalized patient, and that steroids again, may be a good thing when used in combination with epinephrine, okay, but not by themselves. All right, and supportive care remains the mainstay of our treatment. So that item number three for twin, uh, twin A, you know, suck his nose out, send him home with some saline drops, pat the parents on the back, tell them they're not gonna sleep a lot, rah, rah, come back, if these things exist, is what you would do for him. Twin B is a little different and would probably end up getting admitted given their degree of respiratory distress.